On behalf of the School Nutrition Section, it is a great privilege to join you this afternoon to talk about our favorite subject. And I couldn't thank Dr. Johnson more for teeing up this conversation as he did so nicely to point out the needs of so many who are under-reflected in our school nutrition program. Uh, we've adopted as our philosophy in the division, we think nutrition because students cannot think without it. That's been our mantra for many, many years. And uh, I want to recall a conversation at the August board meeting that brought us to this place today. As you may uh, uh, revisit the presentation made by the whole child committee, suggesting that we can do more to address the needs of the whole child. And certainly among those needs was to ensure that children are adequately nourished as part of the uh, instructional day. That conversation led to additional dialogue about what we're doing in the school nutrition environment, have been doing for quite some time, to expand students' access to school meals, and has culminated in the conversation today. I'm, I'm happy to be a part of a panel to address from various perspectives the needs of students relative to healthy school meals. Just for those of you who may be new to the conversation of school meals and the role of the Department of Public Instruction in administering those meals, we administer the programs you see here. Many of you are familiar with them, having participated in them yourselves. Uh, school meal programs go back to 1946. We have quite a legacy of supporting not only education, but ed uh, supporting the health of students and families, supporting the economic base in many of our rural and metropolitan communities, and certainly supporting homeland security. The uh, roots of the school nutrition programs come in the protection of our country as we look at uh, the post-World War II era. These programs have continued to sustain themselves and are now considered for many students critical safety nets. I'll call your attention to two of the items that you may not be familiar with. In administering the, the federally assisted, I choose that word as opposed to federally funded, but federally assisted school nutrition programs, we also provide technical assistance, training, and professional development to school nutrition professionals across the state. We provide roughly 120, thank you. We provide roughly 120 days of professional development to school nutrition professionals, both in their districts and in areas. We also, uh, as part of that academy, uh, offer the K-12 Culinary Institute for school nutrition managers at the school level to help them develop the culinary skills required to produce the most exciting, appealing, and nutritious meals for students. Now, the why we do what we do. What we do what we do is simply based on the science to begin with of nutrition. We know that by having adequate nutrients, we support brain growth and development. Those nutrients also create uh, a, a relationship in the brain where the nutrients in food provide the source of neurotransmitters. Those neurotransmitters fire off uh, into the, the sequence, and as a result, students are able to think. They are able to assume those higher level operating skills, the critical thinking skills, the synthesis, the discernment, the, the judgment, those Bloom's taxonomy, higher level achievements. The absence of those essential nutrients impairs a student's ability to learn for many reasons. Not only are the neurotransmitters not firing to prepare students to, to think critically, but there's also a concern that there's not sufficient energy to support students' metabolic rates. So as to keep them uh, metabolically active, keep their brains alert, their bodies alert. So non-nutritious food and an unhealthy diet is actually counterproductive to our goals. That's why you've seen a tremendous change in the content of school meals over the past decade. Our goal is to make certain that it's not just feeding children, but it's offering nourishment, highly uh, nutritious meals to students. Now, that's a change for many students. They're not accustomed to some of the healthful fare they're provided now in public schools, and you may be hearing some of that uh, pushback. But we continue to pursue to make certain that we're providing, again, the most nutritious meals for students. At the end of the day, we believe that our work is about nourishing students' bodies, minds, and souls. And I think if you've been in a school nutrition dining room uh, lately, you've seen the warm embrace that school nutrition professionals provide to children every day as they see them, get to know them, and become part of their lives. So the why, it's about helping children learn. It's also about helping children thrive. 
we're going to talk today specifically about the school breakfast program and how we can expand more of opportunities for our local schools around school breakfast. This is not necessarily a new initiative to us. In fact, I'm going to credit the, the State Board of Education for a lot of the momentum we've seen in expanding school breakfast based on the work that was done in 2011. But as a forerunner to that, uh, in 2010, North Carolina was recognized by the Food Research and Action Center, a national anti-hunger center, for our, our provision of school meals in our public schools. 96% of schools in North Carolina offered the school breakfast program. That was unheard of nationally. We were so proud of the fact that so many of our schools recognized the need to offer breakfast when it wasn't necessarily a requirement for them to do so. But as we began to dig a bit deeper into the data, we became concerned about something. While 96% of our schools were offering the meal, fewer than 30% of students were actually receiving that meal and participating in that meal. And that caused, caused great concern for us. Certainly we were proud of the work that schools were doing to reach out to students, but we knew we could do much better when it came to engaging students and actually making sure they benefited from the nutrients provided in those meals. We began to talk with students, parents, teachers. We did extensive interviews with principals and school nutrition administrators to find out why this problem existed. Why do we have so many students who are coming to school who have breakfast available to them but are not uh, taking advantage of that breakfast? We discovered a variety of conditions. We'll speak about those in just one moment. But in order to address those conditions, we developed extensive resources for teachers and school personnel, for principals, for, for parents, for communities for families to talk about and engage more in the importance of school meals as part of the instructional day. We began to have statewide discussions around access to school meals, access to school meals. In talking about this breakfast is brain fuel toolkit, we discovered that the problem was that children were in the vicinity, but they didn't necessarily have access unintentionally. As we looked at the notion of meals being available to students, as they were in so many of our public schools. We discovered that the issues related to accessibility were problematic for us. Just to hear a few of those. My bus is always late. The carpool is always late. There's some reason that I'm not getting to school on time. I don't want to be late for the morning bell. There may be consequences if I arrive late. There may be punishment. I'd rather not have the meal than to endure what that consequence might be. Oh, I don't like standing in line with kids who are bigger than I am. I think had we really looked closely at this piece of data, we would have seen that there were some remnants of bullying around the school uh, dining facility where larger kids actually seemed to hover over the smaller children, and they just didn't want to have any part of that. They were afraid. I don't have money for breakfast. That was another problem. Children just didn't show up because they knew they didn't need to, they didn't have money to buy the meal. And even if students qualified for reduced price meals, there was still at that time a 30 cent per meal copay. I'm happy to say this is a problem that North Carolina has addressed head on and has resolved. Uh, our, our General Assembly has provided that 30 cent copay now for all children who qualify for reduced price meals. So that's, that's a step forward for us. We can say that there's a good segment of children who now receive breakfast at no cost. We're looking for the same kind of provision, hopefully, in uh, a budget, when we have one, in the coming year that will address the lunch meal. Now, here's what bothers me the most. If you look at the bottom statement, I don't want my friends to know that I am poor. Overwhelmingly, this is the response that came from children to say, this is why I don't eat breakfast, because breakfast is for poor children, and I don't want to be associated with poor children. So they, while the breakfast was available for them, their self-esteem, their sense of self-worth would not allow them to walk to the breakfast uh, line to receive that meal. Even though breakfast is available for all children, it's not just a program for students who are economically disadvantaged, but children's self-esteem was on the line and they didn't want to, to compromise that. One of the most sobering comments I ever heard a child say, I'll never forget this, very similar to what you just heard Dr. Johnson say as he talked about the children who, who it's not their turn to eat, I'll eat three nights from now was when a child said, I don't go there because it's like a walk of shame. I don't go to the school cafeteria because I feel ashamed. That let us know we had our work cut out for us. We have to do something differently in order to shape this conversation. 
children should never feel shamed for the source of their, uh, their meals. I'm proud to say the Department of Public Instruction, we also began to have these kinds of conversations. We went to our accountability partners and uh, for the first time we said, let's do away with that subset called free and reduced lunch. Let's eliminate that. Because if we're uh, reporting student outcomes based upon the children who qualify for free and reduced lunch, we're gonna ultimately send messages to children that continue to stigmatize school meals. So we moved to nomenclature that suggests that uh, we're reporting about economically disadvantaged children. This is a category in which I think people, all of us, could feel ourselves at one time or another comfortable fitting into that environment. So we, we purposely removed that uh, language in order to overcome some of these barriers. What we also saw that was behind this particular data is, the, is hunger in our state. We were at this time really concerned about school breakfast and school lunch as a means of helping to uh, minimize child obesity and overweight. We were very focused there, not realizing that what was underlying this problem was a tremendous problem of children coming to school not being adequately nourished because there's simply not enough food at home. We saw that uh, in our state, and this figure remains pretty stable, nearly 60% of students enrolled in our public schools qualify for free or reduced price meal benefits. What does that mean? For children who qualify for free meal benefits, households size and income is roughly 130% of poverty. For children who qualify for reduced price meals, the household income and size is roughly between 130% of poverty and 185% of poverty. These are those working poor households that Dr. Johnson talked just about just a moment ago. I'll call your attention to this final statement on this, on this particular slide. While we are concerned about children who are eligible for meal benefits at school, we are equally concerned about a data set that we can't seem to um, put our fingers on right now. These are children from households at 185% of poverty up to 220% of poverty. These children are ed eligible for supplemental education services and other health-related services, but they are not eligible for free or reduced price meals at school. These children often simply lack the income to pay for that meal. Now, we're hearing a lot in the public media these days about something known as meal shaming. And we're not, not going to talk a lot about meal shaming today. That's for a future conversation that we definitely need to have with one another. But meal shaming suggests that children are being denied meals simply because they no longer have the income to support those meals at school. That huge gap is a gap that, that, about which we are concerned because we, we have resources for children who as we described earlier, qualify for free or reduced price meals, but not those that we've not yet identified. We hope that at the end of our conversation today, we can have an opportunity to explore how we can capture that information about these students. But where one in five children in the United States is at risk for food insecurity and chronic hunger in North Carolina, it's one in four students. We're sometimes edging a little more closely to one in three students. Our numbers are so high. Now, as we look at what's happening in the nation, we see a very shameful statistic for our state. North Carolina is among the top states in the country that exceed the national average for hunger. So what we're seeing in North Carolina is consistent with what we see about the communities across the country. Now, academically, we know that students who are uh, hungry, who are chronically undernourished, do not perform well in the classroom. This is a very typical appearance of a child who's just simply lethargic, would rather not engage because their body is just not well nourished. There's no energy to fuel the basic metabolic functions. They certainly have uh, reduced cognition and, and, and brain function, very limited attention spans. Their ability to stay on task for anything we're asking of them is limited, very short-lived. They have difficulty uh, concentrating and performing complex tasks simply because that science that we spoke of earlier, those neurotransmitters are not firing robustly so as to enable them to engage in those higher level critical thinking skills. They do have more behavioral problems, not necessarily because they're just be, uh, trying to cause trouble by any means, they're hungry. Their minds are thinking about when am I going to eat? My stomach is rumbling. My stomach hurts. Uh, I just can't seem to focus because I'm so hungry. And that distraction leads to other behavioral problems. Now, while that's certainly problematic for that individual child, 
Social anthropologists tell us that it's problematic for every other child in the classroom because that child who is consistently distracted is going to distract every other child sitting in the near vicinity. Hunger does have long-lasting, devastating effects, not just on the social and emotional well-being of children, but on academic success as well. So in order to address this issue of the, the shame that appears to be taking in, place in the school dining environment, plus the knowledge that we now have that, that children must have adequate nutrition in order to perform their best, we began to look at innovative models of delivering the meal to the child instead of the child coming to the dining room to receive the meal. You'll hear a little bit later today about uh, the model of breakfast in the classroom, where meals are literally delivered to children in their classroom. They consume the meal as a part of a small community. Uh, they, they begin to engage in a new culture around food and acceptance with one another. Then there's grab and go breakfast. As children are exiting the bus uh, uh, area or the, uh, the, the parking area as they're coming into schools, they grab a breakfast and they take it to their classroom where they're allowed to enjoy that meal while they're engaging in another developmentally appropriate activity. One of my favorites, I think I relate to this one, second chance breakfast. I am not hungry at 7.30 in the morning, but boy, I'm ready to enjoy breakfast at 9.30. So second chance breakfast allows adolescents largely the opportunity to get to school, get awake, get oriented, and then at 9, 9.30, 10 o'clock, they're probably hungry for a meal. That's when they're most likely to have that, that uh, meal. The good thing about that, we know that when children have access to food just prior to an academic engagement, to some classroom activity, their performance is better than it would be if you had breakfast four hours earlier. So this is working quite well for, for teens. And then universal school breakfast is something that's taking shape in North Carolina as communities begin to see that we all benefit when children are well nourished. Universal meals simply means that the district has chosen to invest whatever resources are available to them to ensure all children have access to meals at little or no cost. Now, I, I, want, to, I want to rewind to say the State Board of Education is certainly to be credited for your amazing role in bringing about those innovative school breakfast programs because it was a resolution that was unanimously signed by the board in 2011 that gave rise to these particular uh, programs and this innovative approach to breakfast. Your resolution was enough to send a message to superintendents, principals, and teachers across the state that breakfast is important enough, so much so that you may count it as part of your instructional day as long as students are engaged in a develop developmentally appropriate education initiative. So you should take uh, great pride in knowing that you were among the first in the country to do what you did and therefore raise the bar to other states to emulate that activity. Now I suspect as we finish our conversation a little later today, you're gonna also take another first and yes, there will be other states looking forward to adopt the same approach that you hopefully will adopt a little later today. Innovative school breakfast works. We have seen the data. It shows that certainly children have improved memory and cognition, just as we do when we have the opportunity for nutritious meals. The improvement in problem solving skills, reading and math scores improve, and outcomes for standardized tests improve. We also see children are less likely to be tardy. They are less likely to be ab absent from school. They are less likely to uh, pose behavioral challenges in the classroom. So the opportunity to create that culture of focusing on learning becomes much greater as a result of these innovative programs. One of the goals in the most recent strategic plan for the board was to continuously improve the number of innovative school uh, breakfast programs in the, in the uh, state. The, as we were collecting the data annually, we were amazed when we began to see the uptake the increase in the numbers of innovative school breakfast programs. So this is great news, again, attributable to the leadership of the board in adopting this as a priority during a strategic plan. We're not where we need to be, however. We still have issues that we need to address in order to bridge the gap, so to speak. In 2015, we were invited to participate in the, the Leandro case to testify uh, spent a great amount of time with Judge Manning, and we used as our conceptual framework the opportunity to support and, and to offer school meals as a part of a basic 
education, sound basic education for all children. He was certainly enamored with that concept and uh, turned and said, please let me know whatever we can do to help share, make sure every child receives meals in North Carolina. So clearly, school nutrition programs have become critical safety nets for many households. Many of the working poor households that Dr. Johnson just spoke about still struggle to provide meals for, for children. A, 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 an increase in fuel prices by just 20 cents can be enough to keep a child from receiving a meal at school. Children, ha families have to make the, the decision, do I purchase fuel that gets me to and from work, or do I purchase uh, meals for ch my ch children? Unfortunately, it's a decision that's, that's all too often difficult for many. So here's where we are, and as we're continuing our, our conversation and uh, about to launch to the ex real experts in the room on school meals, Currently, only 59% of North Carolina students who are eligible for reduced price lunch, reduced price lunch, are also receiving breakfast. This means we have over 250,000 children that we need to uh, provide meals for. Uh, these children, we're not sure why they're not accessing meals because meals are available at the school every day. But these children are economically disadvantaged. They qualify for the meal service. We, we need to figure out why it is that they're not consuming meals. And then we want to continue to look at what this bridging of the nutrition gap can mean not only for children, but what it can ultimately mean for school districts. If we were to recognize, again, that 59% and a very modest goal of increasing to 70% of all students uh, who are eligible for free or reduced price lunch having that uh, breakfast meal, we're looking at closing the gap in a manner that brings in two and a half million more dollars in federal funds to support that meal service. As I mentioned earlier, school meals are federally assisted. So as children increase in participation, the benefit of federal money comes back to the school district. So as we transition now in our conversation from what's been happening in the department and in the community around nutrition, I think I'd, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the, the amazing collaboration that we've had with our colleagues at No Kid Hungry North Carolina. Because as, as the department has been working in administering and overseeing the programs, uh, we have relied upon our colleagues in No Kid Hungry to begin to help us with discussing the importance of access by providing conversations, providing information, providing data. Uh, in fact, the, the data you'll find at your table, the data to show what the nutrition gaps are. So people may begin to make decisions about how they can expand breakfast participation. Conducting outreach and activities. Our, our No Kid Hungry partners literally go to speak with county government officials, uh, municipalities, to talk about what this could mean for the entire community, economically, as well as uh, from a health perspective, an education perspective. Providing grant funding. Many of our schools have benefited from startup grants to help them purchase the equipment they need to make innovative school breakfasts a reality. And then collaborating on events such as the Summer Palooza. If you've not participated, I invite you now, because we're beginning to think about summer meals at this chilly time of year, because we know that, that we have to make the same progress in addressing summer meals for all of our children, as well as breakfast. And then coordinating to achieve the mutual goals that we, that we uh, all aim for, where children's health and meal access is concerned. So again, I want to reemphasize the importance of the data, the, the importance of the anecdotal data as well, because we're going to begin to hear from our colleagues, teacher, superintendent, and most important, from the student perspective, as we look a little closer at the issue. Thank you. Julie? Good afternoon. Uh, while we're waiting for my presentation to come up, um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Julie Pittman. I have been an educator for 22 years and for the last 17 years in Rutherford County as an English teacher at RS Central High School. Um, last year I was lucky enough to serve with my colleague Freebird McKinney on his regional team as the Western Region Teacher of the Year. Um, and I've worked with Dr. Harvey over the last uh, year. Um, on school nutrition and there we go um, and how we can work to 
close that breakfast gap in North Carolina. Um, so I'm really excited to be here today uh, to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart. But I want to first talk to you about why it is important to me. I was a student um, at the very young age of five years old in first grade in North Carolina, in eastern North Carolina. I'm a product of Johnston County Schools. I uh, graduated from Smithfield Selma High School in 1991. Um, but at five years old, when my parents divorced and my mom and my sister and I moved to North Carolina, my mom was a school teacher and it was April and she was a school teacher in Maryland. And so she didn't have a job until the fall. And so for many months, we lived on a very meager, uh, meager means. And I was enrolled in school uh, and qualified for free lunch. And so at a very young age, I understood that lunchroom shaming that Dr. Harvey talked about. Uh, and my mom being a school teacher really didn't want me to have to experience that. So we did a lot as a family to try to make ends meet so that I wouldn't have to walk through the free lunch line which is something that exists in some schools. Um, and that lunchroom shaming is real and it is ugly and it is lifelong affecting for young, young students. Um, as a high school teacher, about seven years ago, I noticed in my classroom that I had students who had food in their book bags half-eaten hamburgers wrapped up in a napkin, open cartons of milk at 1.30 in the afternoon, and knowing that we are a large landmass county, um, I knew where these kids lived and that they might get home by 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon and they might get that food in the refrigerator long after it should have been refrigerated, but that probably they were taking that food home for their evening time meal or even worse for a younger sibling who wasn't being served by the public school system. And I realized that for a couple of days a week I was able to teach, but for several days I was not because my students were hungry. So on Monday morning, Mondays are, are horrible for kids who haven't eaten for three days. And talk about a long weekend, that's a, that's a devastating time for a student to be in class and a hard time for a teacher to try to manage. So like I said, I teach, for, um, I teach high school, and we're on a four by four block. Oftentimes, fourth period is a real hot mess, um, especially when you have students who are grasping for where their next meal is going to come from. So during that time, during that fourth period about seven years ago, I was able to teach on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, but sometimes on Thursdays, like I said, Mondays were not, and Fridays were a wash. So my students were getting about half the instruction time that they needed because their needs were not being met in the classroom. So my district was about 75% free and reduced lunch um, qualified students. And my student Tristan's going to talk about this a little bit later. Uh, but our school board adopted or our school board pushed for our entire district to become CEP. So um, all of our students had opportunity to get uh, breakfast and lunch at no cost. And after that happened, and after we started working uh, at having a second chance breakfast, uh, which happens after the first, the first bell or the first period bell, um, and we started a really robust backpack program, I started noticing that students were more engaged on a full length of the classroom day. Um, and then I was able to teach those fourth period students just like I was able to teach first, second, and third period students. Uh, my students were really much more engaged. So I come to you today as a passionate educator, as somebody who understands what it means to educate the whole child, and that doesn't necessarily mean through content and curriculum. It actually means that we, as a public school, are a one-stop shop for our students. They come to us early in the morning, and they long for food, and they long for belonging, and they long for love and acceptance. They they long for all of it, and we're there as a public school system to give it to them. So I, I am very lucky that this year that No Kid Hungry and Dr. Harvey have partnered to um, create a position for me in North Carolina as a teacher on loan from Rutherford County Schools to be the North Carolina Educator Outreach Manager for No Kid Hungry in North Carolina. So I'm working across the state. Someone asked me which districts I was working in, and I said the North Carolina district. Um, so I'm working across the state tirelessly um, to reach into districts and help educators, and by educators I mean everyone who has a vested interest in education, understand why Brexit 
breakfast as part of the instructional day is a way that we as a public school system in North Carolina can absolutely close the opportunity gaps for our students. So let's talk about um, No Kid Hungry. No Kid Hungry um, is a national campaign that was launched by the nonprofit Share Our Strength in 2010. Share Our Strength has been around for over 30 years. Um, they work in every state in North Carolina. Um, its goal is to end childhood hunger, not put a dent in it, not try to help reduce childhood hunger, but to absolutely end it. And it is their goal and their mission to do that. No Kid Hungry North Carolina is a public-private coalition between Share Our Strength and the UNC Center for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention, working to end childhood hunger here in North Carolina, specifically partnering with public schools. Um, how we do that is through a variety of ways. We're working um, to create policy and change policy at the state level. Um, we're researching um, ways that, that we can reach more students through school meals. We work with low-income families to help them understand um, healthier lifestyles through nutrition and how to get healthy food on a budget. We work with summer meal sites, um, making sure that students are able to be fed early in the morning and all the way through the end of the summer. Um, we're working with local community groups to receive tools and resources to end childhood hunger in their own communities. And then we're, what my work this year is mostly focused on is working with schools to get them the things that they need so that they can offer the meals that, that are accessible to students all throughout the day. Um, no Kid Hungry increases access to that federal nutrition program that Dr. Harvey talked about that assists in, um, in helping students or helping schools get those meals to students. Um, these nutrition programs already exist to feed our students. Um, and No Kid Hungry generates the will and the skill to make that happen. So I want to talk about the importance of, of school breakfast and why it's important. So how is school breakfast going to help close the achievement gap and the opportunity gap for students? So it starts with the whole child. I love um, that Dr. Harvey and I have a great um, uh, understanding of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and, and we work with that a lot in both of our work. But my job... And really, I, I learned this from Freebird, or I, I, I'm going to steal this from Freebird. My job description is that top triangle. As a high school teacher, as any teacher, my job is to make sure that my students actually become who they were meant to be. But I cannot do that if every other level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is not met. And at the bottom, in that physiological needs section, that's where food is. So if I'm trying to teach my students how to become responsible community members, that we are building those communities to better their own communities, if I'm trying to teach them that without feeding them, and when they're hungry, that's like putting a house, a roof on a house with no foundation. I become a glorified babysitter in the morning when I have a kid who hasn't eaten because they are not getting the content that is determined by my job description. Um, let me back up just a minute. I'm a high school teacher, but we're all educators. If you have a vested interest in public schools in North Carolina, you are an educator. I'm not just an educator because I'm a teacher. I am an educator because that's, called, that's who I'm called to be. I am called to serve students. I serve students through my curriculum and through my relationships and through my motivation for my students. My school nutrition work, my school nutrition staff, they are also educators. They are called to serve students through the nutritious meals and relationships that they build with students on a daily basis. If you don't believe it, walk into any public school that serves breakfast and get on the line and find out how many names of kids in the building those ladies and gentlemen know. Because I guarantee you it will be more than the vast majority of the teachers who are in the classrooms. The custodial staff, they are educators. They serve students through making sure that we have safe and clean schools. That front office staff, they are the first line of defense 
also educators. Bus drivers, very first and last people who see our students, also educators. And you, as school board members, you are also educators. You are serving our students through the work that you do, the policies that you create, and the vision and guidance that you give us as a state of North Carolina. We are all educators, and we are all called to this work to make sure we are serving the needs of all and each and every one of our students. So let's talk a little bit about how data can help us close the opportunity gaps. All right, kids come to school hungry. Teachers say it, I say it, talk to any teacher. Kids come to school hungry. Three out of four educators um, see students who regularly come to school hungry. Three out of four educators. 57% of our teachers regularly buy food and on average they are forking out over $300 a year of their own money, not for school resources, for food for students and this is where I think you all should be jumping up and down and saying where do I sign up school breakfast is a big deal because on average math scores can increase by 17 and a half percent when students eat breakfast on a regular basis 17 and a half percent take that to any principal in the state of North Carolina and tell them to start serving breakfast and their math test scores will go up and I guarantee you they will want to sign up for that 20 percent chance greater of graduating from high school so let's increase our graduation cohort rate and we have a new study that's coming out by the end of this year that share our strength and no Kid Hungry has commissioned, and it will, um, it will bring a correlation between a lower absentee rate, so a chronic absenteeism will lower when students eat breakfast on a regular basis. So students come to school early in the morning, and many of them don't get up or don't get home until late. I have students who get on the bus at a quarter till six in the morning. And they may not get home until after practice, until well after 7 or 8 o'clock at night. And if the only meal that they are actually having access to is lunch because they are walked through the cafeteria, we are doing them a disservice. But we're also doing ourselves a disservice. I have sat at many school board meetings that, that have been at the state and, and local level where people are talking about student achievement. And it is only in terms of test scores. If we are only looking at what we're serving our kids in the classroom through curriculum and not through our whole child, not by meeting the needs of each of our kids when they walk through the door until when they get home, we are missing the boat. And we can close that opportunity gap by simply serving them breakfast and making sure they have access to it. So let's look at how we can do that um, through changing the culture of our schools. So making breakfast a part of the instructional day. It addresses common barriers of traditional cafeteria breakfast. It ensures more students are able to start the day with a healthy meal. And it sets an equitable playing field by ensuring that every single student sitting in every single classroom has access to a meal at the start of the day. Breakfast is part of the instructional day is innovative serving models where breakfast is served after the official start of the day. And we do that through several different ways. And Dr. Harvey began to, um, to talk about that with breakfast in the classroom, with grab and go to the classroom, and second chance breakfast. So breakfast in the classroom is just how she talked about it. It's breakfast that's served, um, is served in the classroom. So I want to tell you a story. I have twin 10-year-old daughters there in fifth grade at Rutherford Elementary School. And um, a few years ago, they had a classroom teacher. Their whole school serves breakfast in the classroom. They had a classroom teacher who was able to give my children something that I could not give them. My husband and I, we are fully capable of feeding our children three meals a day, five meals a day, however many meals they want to. But we are a busy family. My girls are competitive dancers. They don't get home from dance any night of the week before 7 o'clock. And so I, we're not able to give them something that I grew up doing, and that was sitting around the dinner table and talking about our day. But when I walked into their classroom a few years ago, and I saw their teacher sitting around a table with all of her students, and they were all eating breakfast as a family meal, she was giving them a gift that I could not, a favorite family pastime of mine. 
She was building a relationship with them. She was teaching them how to read labels on food. She was talking to them about their day, about their likes. She was doing innovative reading of instructional texts, which anyone will tell you is in every curriculum, reading across the curriculum from pre-K through 12th grade. So she was giving them instructional time and relationship building over a family meal over breakfast in the classroom. That, my friends, is an innovative breakfast model and a way to serve the whole child from the very first time they walk into the classroom. Oop. Grab and go to the classroom is simply like Dr. Harvey said, you grab a meal and you go to the classroom and eat it. It can be around family meal like my daughter's uh, teacher did, or it can be while they're doing some other uh, instructional instructional activity in the classroom and second chance breakfast which is offered after first period traditionally in middle school and high schools when those students um, are a little bit more awake and ready to eat a breakfast so let's talk a little bit about what the numbers look like when you serve breakfast in the classroom you can increase your breakfast participation by up to 88 percent um, with grab and go, up to 59% participation, and with second chance breakfast, up to 58% participation. So take a look at those numbers, and let's remember what they are, because when Dr. Harvey and I come back at the end and talk to you about our call to action, these numbers are going to be really critical for how you're going to be able to move forward. It's important to remember that when implemented correctly, that breakfast as a part of the instructional day won't take away from instruction time because teachers can integrate it into what they're doing already in the classroom. That it won't place unnecessary burden on educators. It won't make a mess of your classroom, which I think is, I mean, I'm in the business of serving kids. Like, kids are my business. And people who complain about trash in their classroom, that's an adult problem. So a, a teacher who complains about uh, trash as a part of breakfast will probably also be the teacher who is complaining about balled up pieces of paper at three o'clock. So let's talk about how we can address that whole issue in the classroom as a classroom management issue. That's not a breakfast issue. That's just an issue of having to teach kids. And if they should be getting that at home, you're right, they should, but they're not. So let's address it in the classroom. Um, it also provides nutritious meals to your students. Now, I'm an English teacher, and you may be saying, why in the world is this woman up here talking to us about a child nutrition? Because I do not have any real um, a formal education on child nutrition, but I'm a classroom teacher who knows a lot about food, and it may not look like it, but I do love to eat. Um, so I can tell you that this year I have learned a lot about nutrition and school nutrition and how nutritious those meals are, that they are fortified with vitamins, they are fortified with grains, they meet every nutritional need that is that is um, determined by the, the federal regulation, and that if students eat uh, br breakfast every day and lunch every day in school, they will get the nutritional needs that they need for an entire week. So encourage your kids to eat school meals. Um, and they're paid for by federal nutrition funds, not the general school funding. So there are a lot of things that breakfast in the classroom, breakfast as a grab and go or as a second chance breakfast, along with the lunches that are served in schools, can really meet the needs of your students. And when you're thinking about how you as a board are trying to address the whole child and what we can do, it really does start with the very first time that we see them and how we're making sure that they're ready for instruction and ready to learn in class. So I'm going to, um, I'm really excited today to be able to bring two people who I find truly inspirational. Um, the first one is Dr. Robert Taylor, who's the superintendent of Bladen County Schools. And then um, after Dr. Taylor, I'm going to introduce to you one of my students from Rutherford County Schools. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Taylor. Thank you, Julie. I guess they would uh, set the superintendent up and have him to follow a dynamic speaker such as Julie, but uh, just a uh, pleasure to follow you. I do want to thank uh, Chairman Davis and uh, Vice Chairman Duncan and the rest of the board for having me here. Uh, what I will share is, is, is not going to be long. They asked me to talk about how breakfast in the classroom started uh, in my district and how I share data uh, with my school board, the value of that. 
Um, and kind of my role as superintendent when it relates to all of this and, and breakfast participation in general. And so for Bladen County, we, uh, we don't consider ourselves the model uh, of uh, breakfast programs, uh, child nutrition programs, but we've certainly been put on the forefront uh, as a result of the work that we've done. And I can tell you that uh, the most important part of what we do in Bladen County started with our child nutrition director. And what I would um, express and share with all of my superintendent colleagues is that make sure you have an opportunity to have a conversation uh, with your child nutrition director and understand the dynamics associated with that program. And so because of the work of Amy Stanley uh, in our district, uh, we've had an opportunity to expose not only our students, but our, our teachers, our school board, and everybody in the community about the work that can be done. And so for Bladen County, it started out with uh, Elizabethtown Primary School. It was, uh, it's our largest elementary school of about 600 students at the time. And if you think about trying to feed 600 uh, primary school students, K through four, uh, in a traditional breakfast program, you can understand how difficult that may be. So they had lines going out the cafeteria that took all sorts of time uh, to get those students fed. Amy talked with the principal uh, at the time and suggested that they look at breakfast in the classroom. And so they started this program. Uh, uh, the teachers really embraced everything that took place with it, and it really made a difference in terms of uh, how we were able to meet the needs of those students. Uh, so uh, we obviously shared that information with other uh, schools around the district and, and hope that they would participate as well. But as always, those common barriers stand in the place, the things that Julie talked about, and for the most part, it's called inconvenience to grown folk inconvenience to grown folk. And the way I look at this uh, would be the Bull Connors and the George Wallaces of the 1960s that stand in the schoolhouse door uh, and prevent children from getting a quality education. You would be surprised at the amount of pushback that you get when you try and implement a program like this. I had the opportunity to go to Chicago for the state of North Carolina uh, and work on a grant uh, with uh, No Kid Hungry. And there was a state representative from Oregon I think it was Oregon, he was Oregon or Washington. Uh, and he talked about how he had been inspired as a state legislator to change and, and push for legislation to uh, change things in the state where he was. And it took nearly a decade to get that legislation through. He said he was surprised at the number of people that would talk about how they want to feed children but actually stand in the way uh, of that kind of legislation being passed. And so uh, don't be surprised if, as a, as a superintendent or a principal, that you try to implement these kinds of programs that people won't stand in the way. And so uh, in Bladen County, we had the same kind of issue. You ask principals about it, they wouldn't want to do it. Well, who has the ultimate authority in a school district? The school, no, not the superintendent. We learned that real quick, don't we, Patrick? Uh, it is the school board, and they have the opportunity to uh, create uh, district policy. Uh, and like all things, they're, uh, they're politicians and their constituents have a way of getting to them about uh, pushing for things that they want to have change. Uh, the idea is to inform a school board before that opportunity comes. And so what we did was to present to our school board the results of uh, our uh, uh, breakfast in the classroom program. And when the school board was able to hear that information, and it was not interfered by someone else who did not want to do that, guess what the board said? Well, why aren't all schools doing this? I make a motion that all schools, blah, 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 second, before you know it, it was passed. And so at that point, as a principal, are you going to call a board member and tell him you made a stupid decision last night at the board meeting? Absolutely not. And so as a result of that, uh, our school board was informed. They, they, they were able to hear all of the things that Julie talked about, all of the things that Dr. Harvey talked about, and it's really about making sure that you are informed about what these kinds of programs can do for children. As a superintendent, I understand that if children come to school and they're hungry, they're not focused on learning. It is the last thing that occurs to them. Uh, they want to think about uh, how they're going to get something to eat, particularly if you're in a primary school. But if you're in a middle or a high school, there's a total, totally different dynamic. I'm 14 or 15 or 16 years old. I'm poor. There's no food on the table. I'm not going to tell my best friend that I'm hungry. 
and I need to go in the cafeteria and eat. And so it's making sure that people understand what happens to children when they come to school and how we can close some of those barriers. And so, uh, again, the most important thing is to be able to share information uh, with a school board so they can be informed about what actually takes place uh, when we look at children in these areas. Now, uh, what I've also done for my district is to take a different stance with my principals. Uh, uh, Patrick, my counterpart, would tell you that what gets monitored is what gets done with principals. And so if you put something in front of them and you monitor that, uh, then they're going to work to make sure it gets done. Uh, as principals, there are only two goals that they are required to have by the state of North Carolina, I should say the State Board of Education. Uh, that is an instructional goal and a human resources goal. But I also have a child nutrition goal for every one of my principals. And so uh, if you are at a primary school, uh, your goal is 90% participation for breakfast. If you are at a middle school, is 80% and at a high school is 70%. So you may ask me, how did you come up with those numbers? Well, it was because of, of an award that one of my high schools received. East Bladen High School, along with Elizabethtown Middle School, they were identified and recognized uh, two years ago as um, in the top three schools uh, in the state in terms of increasing breakfast participation. And so East Bladen High School is led, is, is led by Dr. Ray, who certainly understands the dynamics of childhood poverty because he could talk about that at length in terms of what he experienced as a student. And so uh, through the efforts of his school, they were at around 68% breakfast participation. And we all know that a high school is, is, for obvious reasons, going to have the lowest participation rate. So if a high school can get at 68%, Middle school and, and, and primary schools, get in line because your expectations are going to be much higher than that. And so I meet every year, uh, and we go through our goals, and that is one of the things that I look at. Uh, your participation uh, goal, the kinds of activities that you have, and what those numbers look like. Now, uh, it starts out uh, with those principals trying to meet the mandate that Dr. Taylor has set out for them. Uh, but what you hope happens is what happened to Julie that you see a child uh, who has an issue and you recognize that as a principal. Uh, one of my principals, at, the principal at West Bladen High School, uh, she had a student who was accumulating breakfast charges. Now, we are a CEP district, means community el eligibility program, everybody eats at no cost. So how in the world was he able to accumulate uh, breakfast charges? Because they have second chance breakfast at the first breakfast, he was giving his breakfast to another student so he could have two. And then at the second chance breakfast, he would get his, and then he was obviously being charged for that. And so that led that principal to understand that everything that Dr. Taylor was talking about is right under my nose. The principal at Tar Heel Middle School had the same experience of a student who was putting food in the book bag to take home uh, later to eat. And then she immediately recognized that, you know, this is right here under my nose. And if you know anything about Bladen County, we are uh, probably the fourth largest county geographically in the state, very spread out. Uh, we are what you would call a food desert. Uh, when Dr. Johnson talked about uh, being within one mile of a grocery store, well, that's most people in Bladen County. Uh, and so you understand that children don't have these opportunities. And so finally, I see my role as superintendent is really about bringing awareness uh, to these kinds of issues and make sure that everyone else understands. I know that uh, most superintendents in the state uh, have what, what is it, Patrick, less than three years? Less, well, less than five years. We have about uh, 80, 85 superintendents that have that level of experience. So as a new superintendent, what are you focused on? How am I going to get student achievement up? How am I going to get graduation rates up? And you don't think about these kinds of things. Uh, so my goal is, has been to try and educate not only principal school boards, but my constituents about the kind of work that you need to focus on to make sure uh, that students can re that, reach that self-actualization of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so uh, that is uh, not an easy task. Uh, but certainly people respond to it. I had an opportunity to be a part of that grant writing uh, team for the governor uh, uh, for the uh, No Kid Hungry grant. And we had the opportunity to uh, work with 12 districts to be able to write grants to provide uh, funding to support these kinds of programs. 
And so we'd like to think that what we've done in Bladen County is a success. Uh, we're certainly going to keep pushing the envelope. Uh, we know that as a poor community, 76, 77 percent free and reduced lunch, that every student needs this opportunity. I'll end with uh, probably what has been the most difficult situation, uh, and this was at one of my middle schools. And so uh, they knew I had this goal. And we had the Bull Connors that stood in front of the door and said, why can't we do this? And so I went out to the school one morning, and as soon as I walked through the door, uh, the custodian comes up to me. See, Dr. Taylor, come look at this. Come look at this. And drug me in the bathroom. Look at that milk carton all against the wall and blah, blah, blah. I said, well, I'm sorry, but that sounds like a supervision issue to me. It has nothing to do with breakfast in the classroom. And so when I came out, another teacher came to me and gave me all the reasons about why they couldn't do this breakfast in the classroom. They were trying to do grab and go in the, in the, in the atrium where middle school students are. You think they're going to be worried about grabbing food and going and eat? They want to look cool. And so we went through this whole litany of excuses, and I finally had the principal in the office, and she was standing there. And I said, let me say something to you guys. As soon as I walked through the door, everybody had a reason or an excuse as to why this can't be done. I haven't heard one explanation or statement about why we can do it. And when you recognize that 76% of the, of the students in this district uh, are free and reduced lunch qualified, then that means the majority of your kids in this school need this kind of assistance. And for you to sit here and tell me that it can't be done because you're inconvenienced as a grown person, then I'm not going to accept it. And so I hope that you guys do the same thing, stand up and, and, and think about the legislation that is possible. I do want to applaud the board for having that as a part of your strategic plan. It speaks volumes about where you are as a board and, and definitely where we need to go as a state. Thank you. So you can see uh, uh, Dr. Taylor is really a, a shining star in our state for making sure that this kind of work happens. I'm always inspired by him. Um, and I would also like to say that um, that last fall, Dr. Taylor was awarded the Friend of School Nutrition Award at the, um, the School Nutrition Association, the, the, state, the state's um, school nutrition conference back in October. I mean, it's one of only two people who are outside of nutrition who have ever been given that award. So congratulations. A lot of times we say that education is something that's done to students, not something that's done with students. And so um, when Dr. Townsend Smith and I were talking about this presentation and I was pitching it to her, um, I mentioned a student who had uh, really impressed me with his just inherent knowledge and, and thirst for, for understanding about how uh, education and policy works. Um, this is a student whom I've known for many years. I've known his family. His uncle is here with him today. Um, and he's just a student who I've seen grow over the course of the four years in high school um, into someone that I think we should all want to have leading our next generation. So it is my honor and my pleasure to introduce you to my student, Tristan Rodrigo Chavez Perez. So, wait, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So like Ms. Pittman said, my name is Tristan and I am a senior at our Central High School and I'll be a first generation Mexican American college student. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm a nationally ranked soccer player and the oldest of three boys raised by a single mother after my father passed away in 2008. I plan to attend the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, but I'm here to talk to you today about the importance of feeding all the kids. Let me tell you a little bit about how Rutherford County Schools work, works to feed its kids. Rutherford County Schools has about a 75% free and reduced priced eligible students, 
And six years ago, our school board made the decision to support um, our entire district becoming CEP. So now we have the opportunity to feed all of our kids for free, but that doesn't always mean that our students have access. My school works to eliminate these barriers um, to food access and feed all the kids. So what exactly does my school do to eliminate these barriers and stigmas? So we have traditional be uh, breakfast, excuse me, before the bell, um, where kids can grab and, and take their breakfast to the classroom or eat them in the commons areas before school starts. Um, and we have first period athletes that, that have morning workouts and they can come claim their, their breakfast before school and then come back to get it after their workout but before first period ends. And the, the school nutrition ladies keep the food hot or cold so the athletes get a good meal in uh, when they need it most. We have a second chance breakfast, which is offered after first period. And high school kids who may not be ready to eat at 7.30 in the morning can also have a chance to eat this breakfast, or in general, anyone who wants to eat it a little later in the day. My first period class last year had breakfast in the classroom. We had an AP class, and most of us weren't used to having to be that awake and engaged at 8 a.m. So our teacher, Mrs. Julie Pittman, brought us breakfast in the classroom so that, um, you know, we all ate and were engaged and ready to learn. At our central, our teachers and administrators and school nutrition staff worked together to make sure they were feeding all the kids. But why is this important? Alternative breakfast models allows access for all students and brings breakfast where the kids are and where they need it most. This also eliminates the stigma that free breakfast can often bring because everyone can eat it and the whole school becomes an extension of the cafeteria. And this promotes healthier students. Often new students or immigrant students or shy students don't know how or where to get the food from the traditional model. So all of these things I've described made it easier for some of our students to get the food they need in school. Breakfast as a part of the instructional workday builds school culture and teaches us all that relationships and responsi responsibilities are important parts of feeding all the kids. And at my school, students know that teachers care about us, not just about learning, but about all that we are and all that we can be. Breakfast in school exemplifies this. Thank you. You can see how, why I'm so proud of him. He's an, an amazing young man um, and has been a great school leader for all of our students and just somebody that I think not only students, his peers, but um, also his teachers really hold him in such high esteem. So we're really proud of him and really excited for his future. Um, I'm going to invite Dr. Harvey to come up here with me because we are going to give you a very specific and um, aggressive but attainable call to action around school nutrition. Um, because I think you've seen it through or heard it throughout the day that school nutrition, specifically breakfast as part of the instructional day, can help close the opportunity gaps for each and every one of our students so that we are making sure that they know that we care about them, body, mind, and soul, holistically from the start of the day to the end of the summer. Um, and when we infuse breakfast as part of the instructional day, we will make North Carolina the best place to live and learn in our public schools. So I can't see that from here, so I'm gonna pull my notes up. <laughs> Um, so uh, we're going to give you two big calls to action. Um, one is around innovative school breakfast. And when I was at the August board meeting, I heard several board members ask about how can we, what kind of metrics do we need to, to look at how we're feeding more kids? How can we make sure that we are going to do this in the most appropriate and um, efficient, way, efficient way? So metrics around innovative school breakfast, um, two things to look at are the percentage of school districts where at least 70 free and reduced uh, priced meal eligible students are eating breakfast for every 100 who eat lunch. 
and uh, the percentage of free and reduced price to eligible students eating breakfast compared with lunch. So what are your action items as we would like to see them? One is to set a goal of a statewide increase from 58% of free and reduced price meal eligible students eating breakfast, um, which is the 2018-19 baseline, to 62% over the next five years. Number two is to identify the barriers districts face in implementing innovative school breakfast models and develop an appropriate action plan for those districts. And number three is to identify the impact on students and school districts of expanding the threshold of eligibility for free and reduced price meals beyond the current 185% of the, of the FPL, such as to the CHIP eligible eligibility threshold of 211% of the federal poverty level. So, so quite simply, we're asking you to do this. If we Maslow, they will bloom. We do our part. They will achieve the successes that we envision for them. We want to continue to see growth around the summer nutrition program as well. So we have proposed expansions in, the, in terms of the number of summer nutrition program sites the length of service for those sites so that we can ensure that we have meal service up to two months during the summer and that we encourage the number of meals that are available at that site the number of sponsoring entities we we propose this with the request from you that we readopt the resolution that we, we committed to in 2011 that we reframe it we refocus it so that we can together address the issues we've learned about today and that we can begin to address the whole child relative to the access to nutritious meals that are available to them. Um, yep, so we have a copy of the resolution um, that is an updated resolution from the 2011 resolution. Um, and it states, the North Carolina State Board of Education, a resolution to support school meals as part of the instructional day from the North Carolina State Board of Education. Whereas the governor of the state of North Carolina and the North Carolina State Board of Education value the 1.5 million public school children in their trust as one of the state's most precious natural resources. And whereas every student in North Carolina is empowered to achieve their full potential and a successful academic path and to pursue a lifelong interest in learning through an equitable state school system. And whereas the State Board of Education is charged with providing a sound basic education for all students, which includes nutritious, appealing meals for students and adequate time to consume them. And whereas research demonstrates that children who eat good breakfast tend to perform better in school, have better attendance, and exhibit fewer behavioral problems, such as decreased tardiness and in-class disruptions, and whereas barriers such as time, place, and stigma make traditional breakfast in the dining room before the school day difficult to access for many students. And whereas making breakfast a part of the school day through innovative breakfast delivery models referred to as breakfast after the bell has been demonstrated to increase access to participation in school breakfast and create an equitable start to the school day for students. And whereas the breakfast in the classroom model specifically is linked with improved test score results, higher attendance rate, and reduction in chronic absenteeism and excessive tardiness, and whereas increasing participation in the federally assisted school breakfast program is an economic benefit to our communities and local school districts. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the governor of the state of North Carolina and the North Carolina State School Board of Education considers time spent by students consuming breakfast after the start of the instructional day to be instructional time. This includes breakfast that is consumed in a classroom by some or all students while a teacher is providing allowable instructional activities simultaneously, such as announcements, attendance, turning in homework, individual or out loud reading, and breakfast that is consumed during a countable homeroom period. Board members direct the secretary to the State Board of Education to enter a copy of this resolution into the official minutes of the North Carolina State Board of Education. And we are pleased to say it's signed by Eric Davis, Chair of the Board, uh, Mark Johnson, Superintendent, and we're anticipating the signature from the Governor shortly. So this is an exciting day for the school nutrition programs and for students across our state. 
If you're interested in knowing more about the data and how the data affect your communities, you will find individual data sets on the table. I'm happy to tell you our regional case managers are armed with the data and they are meeting regularly with superintendents and other educators about the importance of a closing the, the gap. We respectfully thank you for your resounding support of making school meals part of the instructional day so that all kids can benefit from the resource that available, that's available to them. Thank you. Dr. Hardy, 